and welcome to the 1723 podcast with me, your host, Sean Butler. Now, today we're taking a look at two of the main protagonists in the story of the 1723 constitutions. In 1721, John Montague, second Duke of Montague, accepted the position of Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of England. He was the first nobleman to do so, and Montague's installation marked a turning point in Freemasonry's public profile and underpinned its ability to attract a broad, aspirational membership. It also cemented Grand Lodge's authority over the growing number of Masonic Lodges in London and provincial England. Now, uh, as set out below, uh, this is an extract from the Constitutions itself, uh, and I will now read that to you. Noblemen and gentlemen of the best rank, with clergymen and learned scholars of most professions and denominations, have joined and submitted to take the charges and to wear the badges of a free and accepted mason under our present worthy grandmaster, the most noble Prince John, Duke of Montague. The second man we will be investigating is Charles Lennox, second Duke of Richmond, who became the fourth noble Grand Master of Grand Lodge in 1724. He was also master of London's most influential Masonic Lodge, the Horn Tavern in New Palace Yard, Westminster, and a grandson of none other than Charles II. Richmond stamped a pro-Hanoverian angle on 18th century Freemasonry. Now, to find out more about these two fascinating characters and their influence in Freemasonry, we sat down with curator of the Museum of Freemasonry, Mark Dennis, in November of 2022 to find out a little bit more. The Dukes of Montague and Richmond, why are they so important to Freemasonry? They're very early Grand Masters. They're very important in the development of Freemasonry as an organisation and also it's spread across Europe and across the world. And they sound so kind of respectable, don't they? Dukes, Grand Masters. <laughs> These are not old men. Mm -hmm. um, Montague was born in 1690, Grandmaster in 1721, Richmond was born in 1701. These are young men, and Freemasonry mm -hmm. was very much a new, dashing, innovative thing, a fun thing to be part of. Mm -hmm. um, it was also very aristocratic at the start. Uh, Montague was the first aristocrat to become Grandmaster, and his big contribution was to make it fashionable. Suddenly everybody wanted to belong to an organisation that would let you mix with these people who you would mm. never otherwise meet. And when he took the feast, which had previously been in taverns, they hired a livery hall mm. and there was a procession. Suddenly Freemasonry had a completely different profile. There's a fair possibility that he's the first Grand Master of the Freemasons to have laid a foundation stone. Oh. So you're suddenly seeing Freemasonry in public. And people are realising it's there for the very first time. Mm. Richmond? Well, he had a number of noble titles, and one of them was actually in France. So his contribution is to travel Europe, popularising Freemasonry. Mm. Um, when and where did they become Freemasons? Nobody's quite sure. But they both knew a man called John Theophilus Desaguliers. Right. Now, he was an émigré Huguenot mm -hmm. who'd fled persecution. He was a scientist and he knew them through the Royal Society and it's pretty certain he got them into right. Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking at Freemasonry at this period, it's an exciting and dangerous time to be in London. Right. Okay. The Hanoverians have just taken over. Mm -hmm. um, most of Europe is thinking perhaps we should get the Stuart Kings back. It's a free and amazing place to be and these three men, if you simplify it very much, mm -hmm. are the three pillars of that first Grand Lodge. Right. If you think about it, Desigule, he's the brains, he's research and development. Yeah. He's got the intellect. Yeah. Montague, well, he's the managing director because in his time as Grand Master, he takes a look at the organisation, he decides it needs a constitution, that it needs a solid basis from which to be administered, mm. and he actually asks um, James Anderson to bring in all the documents about operative stonemasonry that he can find and turn them into something new for this, this new and amazing organisation. Richmond, well, Richmond's the more committed Freemason. And in a way, he's the marketing man. <laughs> because if Montague's a sound pair of hands, you want to give something to Montague, um, he resurrected the Order of the Bath as a knighthood. Right. Later in his life, he became um, Master General of the Ordnance, which was a big job every castle and fortification and all the cannons. Wow. Um, so he's a safe pair of hands. 
Sure. Um, Richmond, on the other hand, was very committed to his Freemasonry throughout his life. And he travelled in Europe, and everywhere he went, he encouraged it, he founded lodges. Mm. So these three men were incredibly important to the early years of Freemasonry. Yeah. I mean, they, they are clearly... All three of them, and I, I think I think you know absolutely what what you've what you've just said really does hammer home the the importance that of these men to the sort of early foundations of what we would consider of sort of modern Freemasonry. I guess the question is from a personality point of view: Did they know each other? Presumably, they were they, were they close friends? Did were they did they get on? What was the relationship like between Montague and Richmond? They were friends. They were neighbours. They were fellow practical jokers. <laughs> really, um, their their friends called them. Calarissimo and Magnifico, literally the renowned <laughs> one and the marvellous one. Ah. Um, they were celebs. Oh, really? um, okay. Richmond appeared in the paper several hundred times in the first decade after he um, got the dukedom. Montague pretty much kept pace. They were both rich, they were fashionable, they'd both made good marriages. Um, other than that, they were slightly different. Richmond had a dozen children, um, officially. But as far as one can tell, he <laughs> may have done other things. Yeah. Montague, on the other hand, um, had a long and very committed marriage to his wife, mm. um, who possibly wasn't quite as faithful to him. So oh th they're, they're two different sorts of people, but both very clubbable. Um, in terms of practical joking, well, Montague takes the biscuit, really. Mm. Um, he managed to set up a completely um, fantasy performance in a theatre in London. Reckon he could fill it, and he did. Wow. Cue, cue a complete riot, with the, fer <laughs> the furniture being burned outside. Oh, brilliant. And the Duke wow, of Cumberland okay. losing his sword to a Jacobite. Um, <laughs> um, you could do an, in an entire uh, podcast just on Montague uh, and his practical jokes. Oh, really? Okay. Um, Richmond's much more serious, oh, yeah. um, although he's clubbable. Um, and again, Richmond becomes a general. Uh, Montague, who actually fought with um, the Duke of Marlborough. Yeah. He's done more. If he doesn't really want it, he turns the job down. Oh, right. So, you know, they are different men, but they're yeah. very, very close. And they die within a year of each other. I mean, it's interesting. Obviously, I, I guess from what you said, we know a reasonable amount about the two of them, and especially their role within Freemasonry, um, which we've already touched on. What, what sort of happened to them later on after they sort of put these actions into place did they stay friends for the rest of their lives you know was there anything particularly notable that happened to them you know what what exactly happened to them after the recorded history that we're interested in well montague moved on i mean he may well have attended freemasonry but we don't know yeah. i think he'd done his job um he ended up um planting trees um setting up animal sanctuaries oh, right, okay. um he attempted to be a colonial governor which was a total disaster um if you've ever seen buckler's hard in Bewley, which is a lovely, lovely little village that was meant to be a city um oh, and the slope that went down to the river that was meant to be where he'd land his cargoes um didn't work didn't work um richmond on the other hand continued to be very central to the royal court right. um, became a general he joined lots of learned societies. In fact, in the year when he died, he became president of the London Society of Antiquaries. So he was very much involved in the Enlightenment, as right. we term it in, in Europe. Yes. These were very much men looking to a rational future, mm. an improvement of, of mankind. Mm. Um, they died within a year of each other, as I said, 1749 for Montague and 1750-51 for Richmond. And with them died, in a sense, the first period of organised Freemasonry. Right, okay. A single Grand Lodge, a single perspective. The year after, the Ancients Grand Lodge, the Athol Grand Lodge set up, yep. and Freemasonry became two rival organisations for the rest of the, the century. And again, they didn't see the Age of Revolution. No. When the Enlightenment became the American Revolution, the French Revolution, yes. and everything changed. Um, one of the sadnesses, I think, is this period has never been taught in schools. Mm. And if you hear about the Georgian world, you hear about George III and... Mad people King being George, bad King yeah. George and people having their heads chopped off in Paris. But you've got this first half of the century, which is when Freemasonry establishes itself across Europe, when it becomes what it is with yeah. the principles that it has. Why do you think that is, Mark? Why is it that we don't talk more about this? Because any time I hear about this period in history, it sounds fascinating. It sounds really interesting. There's lots of interesting characters. You see a lot of the foundations for what's to come sort of taking root sort of across Europe. But why is it that we don't talk more about this period in history? In a way, it drops between two much more dramatic periods. Uh. Um, it's the period between the two Jacobite uprisings. 
when the Stuarts twice tried to get the throne back. Yeah. And everybody's heard of Bonnie Prince Charlie. Yeah. And that's kind of when people's history starts. Mm. Um, in this period, we were having wars with people. It's just what we did. But no particularly sort of globally <laughs> significant ones. We were just, we were bashing the Dutch and then they bashed us back. Yeah, and the French, the well, yeah. they always do. Yeah. Um, and people don't look at it because it seems like nothing's happened. But in fact, everything changes. Mm. Um, bear in mind, we're only 50 years after the English Civil War. We'd actually tried Republican government, yep. didn't like it, didn't went like back to it. a king. Um, so it's a complete melting pot of science, of philosophy, of political discussion. And in the centre of its Freemasonry, not discussing politics or religion or anything else. And we know that because there's a wonderful book called In Praise of Drunkenness, um, published in France. <laughs> How apt. <laughs> what can I say? Um, the English edition uh, includes an account of one of the very early Grand Lodge feasts, Back in the days when it was easier to get in if you weren't, yes. the guy just sneaked in. Oh, right. Um, and the thing he particularly says is, there's all this fun, this conviviality, this brotherhood, but no mention of anything that divides. So way back to 1720, we've already got one of the big principles in mm. there. And in a world where in every coffee shop and chocolate shop, all that was being talked about was, are we going to be invaded next week? How should we govern our lives? Yeah. Do we need religion and kings? This was an oasis away from that turbulent world. And, and do, you, do you think that was sort of almost part of Richmond's marketing strategy? Do you think that's sort of the thing that he was saying when he was going out and speaking to people? You know, this is something that you can attend, something that you can take up, that is an escape from those. Because, I mean, we don't, living in the modern world, we don't really have to deal with those sorts of thoughts, thankfully, you know, in the UK nowadays. Sadly, obviously, across the world, other people do. But... It, 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 it's, it's an alien concept to us to think about having to worry about those sorts of things. So, so is that how it was seen then? Did people become Freemasons to escape those sorts of conversations? We'll never know because we don't have the actual physical records. Yeah. But it's interesting that Richmond was able to allow French aristocrats to become Freemasons. Mm. Where they could, and one of the things, particularly for an aristocrat, is you're stuck until your dad dies. You're exactly where you are in the hierarchy. You yes. know you'll be three feet away from the king, not four. Yeah. You can't go anywhere or do anything. And yeah. the French aristocrats embraced it. Mm. Um, they could progress within their lodges. They, of course, extended the ceremonies massively. Sure. Um, and it has to be said, the French, they started doing the three craft degrees as stonemasons. And, of course, most of the additional ceremonies in English Freemasonry very much are on that line. Mm. Uh, the French weren't having any of that. They no. rapidly decided to do something else. They were aristocrats. They didn't want to be stonemasons. It's all very well for Richmond trotting around with his apron on, but they, they weren't quite yeah. convinced. No, um, but, they, but they were exposed to Enlightenment ideas in a way that in France you couldn't be, because there mm. you were either a priest, an aristocrat, or everybody else. Right, okay. And there was no interchange, whereas in London... You could move from the top of the working class into the middling sort. Mm -hmm. If you got rich, you might be an aristocrat in two generations. Right, okay. There was a mobility in London and in England that existed nowhere else in Europe. In fact, nowhere else in the world. And it's in that sort of world that Freemasonry was able to flourish. Mm. <laughs> I guess another point to touch on which would be interesting is obviously, we, you know, I've got this image of Richmond sort of gallivanting around Europe talking about Freemasonry, but in France at the time, obviously what was to come within a matter of years w w was, was hugely transformative f for that particular country. When Richmond was there, you know, I don't know if we have records of when he was there, but w w were the tensions already building within the country at that time? Would that have been something that he could have picked up on if he was, say, visiting Paris uh, spreading the good word about Freemasonry in, in, in the years that he was doing so? It was starting to build. Um, there was an underlying admiration for the way that the British did things. Right. Um, because we'd, we'd moved on from there's God who appoints the king and the king tells you what to do. Um, so there was an intellectual spirit building within France. Um, in the end, of course, it ended in the revolution and it yes. really went to the bad with an absolute bloodbath. Yes. Um, but he would have he would have been publicising that. He would have been publicising the fact that you could do scientific experiments, that the sort of things that are happening in the world you can bring into your lodge mm. and do a lecture, see an experiment, understand your world in a way that perhaps you didn't. Um, the path of Freemasonry in France and the other European countries, of course, very different to ours. Of course. And it's, it's noticeable that here, Freemasonry has remained respectable, stable, and is still very much the inheritor of those early principles. Elsewhere in the world, it's had to endure persecution, 
mm. revolution, and it's always come back. Yeah, but it's not being the same story, and that's one of the things we'll cover in the exhibition next year. Yeah, and actually talking about the exhibition, a Montague and Richmond going to be part of that. If if I was coming along to Freemasons Hall to to visit the exhibition on the tercentenary of the Constitutions, would I be able to go in and find out about Montague and Richmond? You certainly will. Um, the exhibition will be in, in three sections. The first is the context, how the constitutions came into being. The second is about the book itself. And the third, as we've just been talking about, is the, con- is the consequences. Yep. The first people you will meet are Richmond and Montague. Right, because okay. remarkably, we have their own copies of the constitutions. Wow. Montague's with his crest gold blocked on it. And Richmond with a Latin dedication to him written by James Anderson himself, the author. Wow. So actually in that one case, in these two books, you are as close to the beginning of organised Freemasonry as you can possibly get. Yes. Because those books would have been in the hands of two of the most important characters and would have travelled with them as they visited their lodges and and travelled across their lives. Amazing. And and I guess that is our our sort of version of time travel now, isn't it? Being able to look at those and and think that Montague and Richmond both actually handled them themselves. That's that's amazing. Listen, Mark... um, we're sort of coming to the end of our, of our of our conversation. If people who are listening to this want to find out more about these two interesting characters, how would you recommend they go about doing that? Well, there's a very good biography on the 1723 website, of course. Yep. If you want to hear a bit more about Montague and you go into the Museum of Freemasonry YouTube channel, um, you'll find that I've done a talk about him with a great many more practical jokes than serious history. <laughs> uh, and again, you can use the resources of the library. We've got a lot of stuff online. Um, and this is the beginning of, in a sense, the next great celebration of Freemasonry. Yeah. The, the tercentenary of, of the creation of Grand Lodge was great. But this is when the explosion of its popularity, of its organisation, and its great spread begins. It's quite a tercentenary. Well, Mark, thank you very much for taking the time to come and speak to us. I think... Everyone will agree that that was really fascinating and I would encourage you to take Mark's advice and go and learn more. And when the exhibition starts, please do come along to Freemasons Hall uh, and go on the journey and engage with the constitutions in a way uh, that you would never have had the opportunity to do so before. Just a reminder from us, make sure you're following us along so you don't miss any of our future podcasts. Make sure that you are following UGLE on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and YouTube, uh, many other social media accounts. Uh, And we are very, very excited to continue the story next time with another fascinating insight into the history of the constitutions so we will see you soon